Welcome everyone. Uh, good evening. I'm Nancy Enright, uh, Director of the University Corps, and I would like to welcome you to a very special event, a talk by a friend of Seton Hall for many years, Reverend Wes Granberg Michelson, on his latest book, Without Oars, Casting Off into a Life of Pilgrimage. I met Wes when he gave a talk for Catholic Studies several years ago, and our connection with him was through Monsignor Rodano, who will give the introduction. This event is sponsored by the University for the Program of Catholic Studies, and the Center for Catholic Studies. Dr. Marta Dewa, Professor of the Library, will moderate the question and answers. Monsignor Rodano? Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce Wesley Granberg Michelson, who will talk about his new book, Without Oars. Uh, I've known Wes uh, for some decades now. We first met when he was working at the World Council of Churches and came with a colleague, Rob Dremelin, to visit us in Rome to talk about ways of collaboration. We have a great deal of collaboration uh, with the Catholic Church and the World Council, and West was one of those, one of our partners uh, in that. Then after his work there, he came back to the United States. He was elected general secretary of his church, which is the Reformed Church in America. And he spent some 17 years in that position. And um, he, is, he, is no, he is known as, as one of the leading ecumenical spokesmen, uh, an ecumenical statesman, I would say. And so um, we're very happy uh, that he joins us now. He has been a leader in promoting ecumenical causes in different ways. For example, in the United States, um, he helped to develop what, was no what is known as Christian Churches Together, which uh, was in, began in around 2001 a movement involving a large number of Christian denominations, including the Catholic Church. And on the international level, he has been a leader of the Global Christian Forum, which is a relatively new effort to bring together traditional denominations such as Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant, Anglican, uh, to deal with and dialogue with the worldwide Pentecostal movement. Pentecostals have some 600 million people and they're still a growing. So this is, this is an important development and Wes has been very, very in, instrumental in, in that uh, uh, cause uh, as, as well. Um, his 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 openness to exploring traditions other than his own is reflected in a statement that is found uh, is found in print where he recalled he, he said that the first time he profoundly experienced God's love was at a Trappist monastery. I don't know if he remembers that statement, but that's in <laughs> that's in in print. <laughs> He's a, he's a creative writer. His last book, which was called From Times Square to Timbuktu, highlighted a primary insight that Wes has spoken about many times, namely that Christianity in the South is becoming more and more important and, than previously, and that all of us need to give attention to that development. He keeps pushing on that issue, which is a very important, a very important uh, issue. And now his new book being released actually today, Without Oars, Casting Off into a Life of Pilgrimage. And pilgrimage is something important for us here at Seton Hall. We have a university core program at Seton Hall, which is meant to take students uh, through a pilgrimage, a journey of transformation. And so when we saw the advertising uh, about Wes's book, we thought that maybe this fits very well into what we're, what we're doing, what we're trying to do here. And so um, 
let us now hear Wes talk about his experience, his experience of pilgrimage and transformation as he tells us about his new book, Without Oars, Casting Off into a Life of Pilgrimage. Wes, it's up to you now. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Monsignor Rodano. Uh, you folks here should know that, uh, that uh, Father Rodano has been one of the real pioneers over years at ecumenical relationships on behalf of the Vatican and the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. He's been a colleague and a friend, and um, it's wonderful to reconnect with, uh, with him here and to be with you at Seton Hall. It's really appropriate that, uh, that the first talk I give from the time that the book is published, actually today, be at a Catholic uh, institution, because there are some deep links uh, between the tradition of pilgrimage and the Catholic faith. I'm very glad to see others who have joined here, including some other outside guests. Um, and uh, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be looking forward to our time of dialogue that, uh, that Marta will lead, will lead. I want to begin at uh, a time exactly where uh, Monsignor Rodano referenced. It was in December of 1972 when I was sitting at my office in uh, Washington, D.C. in the Russell Senate Office Building, room 463. I was the chief legislative assistant to Senator Marco Hatfield. We had just gone through um, an election where Richard Nixon uh, was reelected in an overwhelming uh, majority. Uh, I had been with Senator Hatfield in combating the Vietnam War. He and Senator McGovern were the two leading opponents. Um, and it was a time when I sat at my desk where I was depleted, I was weary, and I was really wondering about my future. Um, I had a, a uh, index card with a phone number written on it, Father Stephen. It was, he was the guest master at the Trappist Monastery, Holy Cross Monastery of Berryville, Virginia. And someone in Church of the Savior, where I had been worshiping, had said, you know, sometime you ought to just try going on a retreat there. Well, I had never been to a monastery, much less a Trappist one. And uh, I had contacted my travel agent, and I was going to go on a trip to the Virgin Islands. And I looked at that card, and for some reason, I picked up the phone and called. And a voice answered, and I mumbled and said, um, this is Wes Graham Berg Michelson. Is there any chance uh, you uh, uh, might have some space for a retreat? And he said, come right away. Uh, the next day I got in my car and I drove not knowing where I was going or why. Headed for Holy Cross Monastery in Berryville, Virginia. And the days that I was there were transforming to me, as, as uh, John Rodano has, has already alluded. It was a life-changing moment. And that has all the marks of pilgrimage, where you step out in a way not completely planned, away from normalcy, and seeking something that pulls you from your heart and you're not always sure why. Let me go back to the year 891 when three Irish pilgrims, Macbeth, Dulcebane, and Malinum, cast off in a boat without oars from the coast of Ireland. It was a boat made of hides. They had enough food for seven days and purposely, without any oars, they wanted to travel, wandering for the love of God. They ended up in Cornwall, England, and that's where they knew they were intended to be. Several stories of other Irish pilgrims are similar. You know of them through books like 
how the Irish saved civilization and many others. But in these stories of pilgrimage, it's not always the external destination that is clear, but rather there's an interior journey where they are abandoning themselves to God's love. Now come with me to August 2018. When I found myself in northern Spain on the Camino de Santiago. Again, I was propelled there by inner beckonings, knowing I wanted, even needed to be on pilgrimage. This is a pilgrimage site which those of you in the Catholic tradition probably know well, goes back to the year 813, in the same century when those three Irish pilgrims set out, when it is purported that the bones of St. James were discovered at a site in Galicia in northern Spain. It became one of the most, um, one of the most important events in medieval Christian Europe. Over the next thousand years, especially beginning at a about uh, the year 1000 until now, pilgrims have gone on pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. There were three primary sites of pilgrimage, especially during the 12th to 16th century. There was, of course, Jerusalem and there was Rome. But the third was Santiago de Compostela. De Compostela where hundreds of thousands would go in a single year. Pilgrimage has continued. By 1980s, uh, there were only a handful of pilgrimages making that journey, but then it revived and began to catch on in a way which I think is important for all of us to understand. The year I went there before COVID, 272,000 pilgrims made the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela from all parts of the world. The day that I arrived to complete my pilgrimage on August 24th and went to the office to get my credential, which is right on my wall, saying that, yes, I had met the requirements of the pilgrimage, 2,330 other pilgrims were there completing their journey. So um, Nancy or Maribel, if I could sure have that first slide. Sure. What I want to simply point out is that religious faith is an embodied journey. It's not a protected cocoon of beliefs. It's a pilgrimage. That's what I've come to understand. And pilgrimage as a, is a way in which we understand and live out our faith journey at any time, even now, even when we're at home even when we are sheltering in place. For we can be on a physical pilgrimage, but we could also be on an interior pilgrimage right where we are. Thank you, Nancy. We could now move back. I want to outline that's coming up next. Oh, this. OK. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no problem. That's fine. I want to outline what our 10 steps uh, that I'll go over briefly that I think capture what happens in pilgrimage. The first one is a disturbance. You break the routine. You, there's a disruption from normalcy. Now, the interesting thing is that for us today, that's been imposed on us by the pandemic. All of us have had to stop and step out of our familiar patterns. Sometimes it's external events like this that force us to do so. Sometimes it's interior 
beckonings and yearnings, or maybe a crisis in life that force us to break with our normal patterns. It's what happened to me in that story that I told you at the beginning when I set off to Berryville, Virginia. And millions of pilgrims have done so, have decided that they need to break with their normal routine and step out in a direction where they are being called, but where the nature and even sometimes the destination are not fully known. The second is detachment. Pilgrimages always mean detachment. Uh, you get distance from your normal life. And I tell you today, the main thing we have to get distance is our screens, our devices, the things that we're with every day, all the time. They're, I mean, they do a lot of good, but they also preoccupy us. And our minds are filled with what constantly is going through our minds and also sometimes across our screens. We have to step away from that. And indeed, we have to give ourselves space so that we begin asking the, the questions that should most should most concern us. I've come up with some of these questions that have guided me. One of them is this. Why are you who you are, where you are? Why are you who you are, where you are? I don't think we give space to those questions unless we become detached from our normal thought process. And walking really helps. Walking really helps. Moving. And that, that's why there's something about pilgrimage that helps move one away, not just in an exterior way, but in an interior way. Um, I'm sure those of you in the Catholic tradition know of Richard Rohr. I've known Richard since Father Rohr for years, uh, when he was uh, head of New Jerusalem community in Cincinnati, and I was at Sojourners Community, we began to know one another, and I followed him. Now he's down here where I am in New Mexico. He's in Albuquerque at the Center for Action and Contemplation. And from time to time, I'm privileged to uh, see him. As you know, he's facing some real health issues now, but he's still, uh, he's still continuing his ministry. And he has said one thing among many that I'd like to repeat. Think of this point of how we detach ourselves from our normal thought process. Richard said, wisdom is not the result of mental effort. And you think about that. Wisdom is not the result of mental effort. It's kind of counterintuitive, opposite of what we might think. Deep wisdom you don't get there just by rational thought. You've got to go deeper. And I think a pilgrimage is what introduces us to that possibility. The third is learning to wait. Learning to wait or persistent patience. Pilgrimages take time. And they teach us. They teach us the value of waiting. And patience, it turns out, is really a pretty critical psychological um, essential in our emotional development. There's this famous uh, marshmallow experiment in the 1960s at uh, Stanford University. You've probably heard of it. Uh, researchers took young kids that were four, five, six, and they put them in a room and they put a marshmallow in front of them. And they said, and they did that individually, but they had a group of them. And they said, now you could either eat this marshmallow now, or you could wait 15 minutes and then you get two marshmallows. <laughs> and, they, and they then tracked 
what these kids did in later life. The kids that took the first marshmallow right away did lower on SAT scores. They were less socially adjusted. They were more prone to issues like addiction. Um, and they're, I mean, of course, it's, there are other factors, but overall, you, you saw that trajectory. Those who waited for the second marshmallow in general did better on those kind of life indexes. And th this experiment's been studied a lot, lots been written about it. But the point is that for emotional development, patience actually turns out to be healthy and very important. Um, and there are two things that are needed for the development of patience and overcoming instant gratification, memory, an attention span, memory and attention span. Now, I think this has tremendous spiritual implications because in our culture, and I'll speak here probably more from my Protestant tradition, uh, our, our churches are so influenced by the desire for instant spiritual gratification. You know, we want what we want now. And, you know, we want that pastor to give us some nuggets in the sermon that we could walk away with. We want to be emotionally and spiritually fulfilled now. We want to read something or get, uh, you know, get something that gives us that emotional high in a spiritual way right away. And I think it's one way in which our culture has, has, uh, has really invaded our own spiritual practices. I, I I'm, I'm not, I, I, I have some guesses about those of you in the Catholic tradition and my own familiar, familiarity with Catholic practices, as Jack has alluded to, Father Rodano. But uh, in spirituality, in faith formation, memory and attention span are really important. I mean, much of our faith is really remembering who we are and whose we are. And we have to have the ability for attention span in order to see the larger picture rather than just the momentary issue or crisis. When you walk on a pilgrimage, there's no way in which you can survive without patience, without one step at a time. The portion of the pilgrimages I, I went on in Santiago de Compostela on the Camino, I walked 344,347 uh, steps. 344,347 steps. Never would I have believed that I could have done that on the day I started. And if I thought each day about all those steps I never would have been able to. It was only by looking at what was ahead of me right then and going step by step patiently that I was able to proceed. And I think that's what's true of our spiritual life. And it's, and it's what pilgrimage teaches us. Now, the fourth thing, is having the strength to let go. And Nancy, I wonder if we could look at the second slide here. It's the strength to let go because it turns out pilgrimages are as much about what we leave behind as they are about where we go. So think with me about this. We tend to think of pilgrimages as journeys to a specific destination. But as much as they might be about place, they are also equally about what the pilgrim leaves behind, propelled by an inward journey. It's this constant focus on how we're 
taking a step forward because we're learning what we have to leave behind that propels us forward in pilgrimage and I think in all of our faith formation. Okay, Nancy, thank you. <clears throat> on every pilgrimage, and when I was on the Camino de Santiago, uh, what you would see are things that pilgrims had left along the way. You know, every pilgrim will pack well. Though well, I sat for three weeks at my couch with a list and trying to lay out everything I needed and making sure I wouldn't take anything I didn't need. And then when you get there and you begin walking, you you've taken too much. You'd walk along and at, at different places, you'll see a, extra shirts or shoes or socks or guidebooks or soap or what things that people are taking out of their packs. They need to leave them behind physically in order to walk ahead. And I think there's a there's a great deeper psychological and spiritual lesson here. Because as we step forward in faith, we need to leave behind past securities, past creations of our ego, past identities that we've invested ourselves in. Um, I think the truth is psychologically that we build up, um, we build up ego strength and we build up uh, ways in which we uh, tell the story of ourselves and our identity and our accomplishments and our achievements. And it, it's all kind of necessary in our development, but we then reach a stage where we begin having to shed those, having to get beyond them, so that those things no longer define who we are. Um, there are a lot, you know, people who are into union psychology will know that uh, union analysts write an awful lot about the second stage of life. But it's not only them, it's a, a very popular evangelical author, Bob B Buford, wrote a book called Halftime. In the, in the evangelical Protestant world, this thing sold hundreds of thousands, and it was about getting to the, you know, halftime of your life and taking stock and deciding to go in another direction. I already mentioned uh, Brother Richard, Richard Rohr. Uh, he, probably his most successful book is Falling Upward, which is a, essentially about the same theme, about getting to a point where you have to realize you're entering into a second stage of life, and you're called to leave behind some of those securities and identities in order to step into God's future for you. To let go in physical and emotional and spiritual ways is critical to pilgrimage. And the question here I'd like to ask is simply this, whose life am I living? Whose life am I living? The fifth, um, the fifth thing that has, I think, as I've outlined these 10 steps, the fifth is learning how we have to walk into faith, how we have to walk into faith. Now, my tradition, I'm a reformed Protestant. I, I come from a tradition that puts a lot of emphasis on thinking our way into faith, thinking our way. And when the Reformation happened, I don't know if you if you know this as Catholics, my Protestant friends, some of whom I think are joining into this uh, sharing. When the Reformation happened, the reformers, Calvin and Luther, they thought pilgrimages were terrible. Luther himself said, pilgrimages, all pilgrimages should stop. There is no good in them. So they rejected the whole, this whole movement. And I think what was happening is that as they were rejecting what they saw as corrupt systems and mistaken harmful doctrines, they wanted to define their faith in tight, rational, confessional boxes. And that's what they did in response. And so from 1520 to 1660, there were 40 or 50 definitive confessions that were written. And this was part of the problem because each one of those confessions was supposed to be the confessions. 
But in typical Protestant fashion, we ended up with about 50 or 60 of them. And, and the, the sense behind them all is that you could capture faith with the right propositional systems. We know some of the uh, consequences of that. The, uh, the religious wars in France took two million lives. And by the time you got to the 30 years war, of course, there were many other factors, but some estimate the deaths sir, were up to eight million. But the problem was also within Protestants, where there was great enmity, including violence and taking of life between one another. Uh, I've come to believe that we have to understand more faith as embodied practices, as embodied practices. And Nancy, maybe you could put up the, the next slide to, sure. which, is, which is sort of the conclusion that I've come to. Some of my reformed friends watching here will, um, might be a little surprised, but uh, here, what I think today is that I'm no longer willing to force my faith into neat confessional boxes, declaring that this is the only way to understand God. I think we've really got to go deeper than that. I think confessions that are so important in the Protestant tradition played a very important role. But I think when we try to force everything into one neat box and say, this is right compared to 40 others like it that are wrong, I think we're in trouble. Thank you, Nancy. Let me move to the fifth step forward. Excuse me, the sixth step forward. And that's what I think pilgrimages teach us to do. And that's to leave predictable piety. Leave predictable piety. We all have our spiritual comfort zones. And I think that the Holy Spirit, and I think the record is right in the book of Acts, constantly wants to break open those, those comfortable uh, comfort zones spiritually. And, and when you think about the experience of pilgrims, they were really stepping out in, in, a, in a risky, almost a reckless way. As they were as, as they were making these long journeys towards a special spiritual destination, one of the um, kind of classic scholarly books on pilgrimage has been written by Victor and I and Edith Turner. It's called Image and Pilgrimage and Pilgrimage in Christian Culture. It's probably the best academic work, at least maybe Marta and others would 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 say otherwise. But it's, it's highly regarded. But there's one sentence that summarizes so much of what I'm trying to say here. Pilgrimages may be thought of as extroverted mysticism, just as mysticism is introverted pilgrimage. I want to repeat that. Pilgrimage may be thought of as extroverted mysticism, just as mysticism is introverted pilgrimage. I think the theme of pilgrimage calls us to, to a kind of spiritual recklessness that's guided by the work of the spirit. The seventh thing is relinquishing control and trusting in grace. Relinquishing control and trusting in grace. I want to ask each of you to think about when your best plans and intentions have fallen apart. Because it happens to all of us. There's a there's a there's a poet and writer, David White, whom some of you may know of. And from one of his poems, he asks this question. When has your life become more than you can plan for? When has your life become more than you can plan for? Those are the times when we all learn to depend on unpredictable grace. 
and depending on unpredictable grace is crucial to the experience of pilgrimage. Um, the stories of hospitality to pilgrims go back the whole history of pilgrimages. It's part of the whole culture of pilgrimage, providing hospitality to those who have no merit, who have who are simply vulnerable, who are simply there to receive that kind of unpredictable grace. The classic story of this, of course, is in Genesis 18, when Abraham and Sarah are in the tent on the plane and these three strangers come by, they're invited in, uh, uh, they, they have a big feast, and then lo and behold, these three angels turn out, the strangers turn out to be angels, and it's them who end up hosting Abraham and Sarah and giving the message that Sarah will give birth to a son. Uh, Orthodox iconography, of course, pictures those three as the Trinity. And it's the perfect story of how hospitality is reversed and we're the recipients of undeserved grace. We're accepted and welcomed not through any merit of our own, but we're sustained daily and that enfolds our soul. That's what happens on pilgrimage. Moreover, that's what should characterize our own faith journey. That one more slide says this, Nancy. And I, I think it was so important for me to come to understand the link between hospitality and grace. Uh, it's, it's the next one there on oh, a pilgrimage okay. on the pilgrimage and in all of life. Just go back one. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I have That's I have that. I have to exit. Uh, yeah, it That's okay. it weird. With well, this. It's I'll, I'll get it. Yeah, I'll get it. I've got it memorized. <laughs> in a pilgrimage and in all of life is hospitality is the means of embodied grace. That's the long one, right? I'm going to get to that in a minute. I'm sorry. That's also good. That's all right. I, I think I think we've got the point. <laughs> all right. we, we, we move on and I'm because I'll get to that in a minute, Nancy. OK, I like that. Uh, the eighth yeah. point. Is is um, rediscovering. Uh, discovering a re enchanted world. Um, uh, and we could I, we could have that. We can have a well. You can leave the quote there if you want, or you can have. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get um, out of it. Um, it's it's. Uh, okay. No problem. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, there you go. There um, we. Go. All right. When when um when I was writing the, the book, I decided that I couldn't finish this without going to law. Because Lourdes, Lourdes apart, uh, apart from Rome, Lourdes is the most visited Christian pilgrim site in the world. And I, I, I wanted to understand what, uh, what happened there. Many, some of you maybe have been there or you have certainly known. Um, and I, as a Protestant, you know, I, I had this image of Lourdes as kind of this place where a lot of souvenir shops sell uh, bottles of water about the Virgin Mary, and uh, that that was about it. Um, I went there and was deeply moved. Um, I'll recite the story for my Protestant friends who may be listening in. It was February 11th in 1858 when a 14-year-old illiterate peasant girl in France had the first of 18 apparitions, which were eventually known to be that of the Virgin Mary. And the ninth apparition, a woman from another village had been, uh, had, had been strangely uh, in, beckoned to come join her. Her name was Catherine Latpie. And 
she went into the back of the grotto where these apparitions were happening, uh, washed her hand, and she had a paralyzed arm, and that hand and arm were healed. Lord's has become a, a site where water is made holy. And it's one of the things I want to emphasize in pilgrimages, common elements take on holy significance. Um, hundreds of thousands of people go to Lourdes, um, and many claim, uh, claim to have miraculous healings. Uh, the, those who are skeptical include the Catholic Church. Uh, many decades ago, they set up a commission, and every possible case of healing is examined uh, to see if there's any other explanation. And they actually, out of 7,000 7, cases examined, they say they find 70 what could be called true miracles. But the experience of people who are there touches a deep, a deep embodied spiritual reality. I sat in front of the grotto for a long time watching every pilgrim who walked by and with their hand traced the water across the stone. And I went into the place where you could immerse yourself into water and then be pulled up on the other side. So much, so reminiscent of the experience of baptism. Um, it's an embodied faith where the physical things of the world take on a spiritual significance. I found the same thing in Nigeria, where I was invited by an ecumenical friend to attend a festival of the Church of the Lord Adalora, one of what's called the African Instituted Churches. And to simply summarize, I found myself at Mount Tabora, a place used only once a year where pilgrims from throughout the country come dressed in white robes and without shoes because the ground is holy and they pray and they dance and they sing all through the night into the morning and the next day. These are Christians who are dancing their way into faith, who are connected with their bodies to the earth and their spirits to their exuberant joy. Um, some of you probably know Charles Taylor wrote the mammoth book on a secular age. And I think who has made one of the greatest contributions in trying to point out why Western civilization has so it has so taken the spiritual mystery out of the physical world and it needs to be re-enchanted. Now, Nancy, maybe we could get that last quote. It's a, it's a quote, it's a long quote from the book, but I want to read and I'll, I'll also say as Nancy is getting it, another example is, is, is in Chamayo, New Mexico, nearby where I live. And there it's holy dirt that takes on a spiritual significance. Um, and that site in Chamayo is probably the most visited Catholic pilgrimage site in the United States, where pilgrims, pilgrims come every year and, and uh, they go into a small room where they take little bits of dirt thought to be of holy significance and carry it with them. Here's the... Um, or I could I could also just read it, Nancy. I'm I'm sorry. I'm it's <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm having trouble with it. Um, That's all right, Nancy. Uh, here's the here's the quote that uh, if if Nancy's trying to get it, I'm I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, and it's and it and it's from a page in my book, but I it it, it summarizes so much of what I'm I I, I experienced about this. Um, there it goes. I can't pretend to say anything with any certainty about the effects of water or dirt or tracing stone at a grotto 
of putting an arm around a statue, statue over an apostle's grave, that's at Santiago de Compostela, or taking shoes off on holy ground. But I know this, these experiences and so many more opened up on pilgrimages explode the myth of a world rationally comprehensible comprised of inert matter and mobilized molecules in diverse forms. I'm willing to wonder about the myths undergirding pilgrim stories and practices. It's the myths of modernity and rationality that need to be destroyed. That's my experience. Uh, ninth, the ninth thing that we need to leave behind is what I like to call the empire, meaning we need to leave behind all those places of power and dominance that define our lives in a regular way. And I go back here even to the example of John the Baptist, who left Jerusalem, the center of political and economic power, and went to the Jordan, to the Jordan River to baptize. And those who came from Jerusalem to see John and hear what he was saying, they were coming on their own pilgrimage. And of course, Jesus did the same. After his baptism, retreated for 40 days. There's a long tradition in the early church of hermits who actually left the places of power and went into the desert. And then the beginning of the monastic movement came when many came to follow them in order to try to understand and absorb their holiness. Pilgrim journeys often leave places of economic or cultural or political power or ca captivity. And I think of this in modern terms. You take the example in East Germany in, in 1989, when hundreds of Christians began worshiping and prayer meetings in the Lutheran church in Leipzig. And it was one secluded space. And those prayer meetings and reflection, they grew and grew more and more began to find a place of expression until at one point between 70,000 to 100,000 people were gathering. And they then marched into the face of the Stasi, the secret police, carrying only candles. And if you carry a candle, you have to carry it in one hand and protect it in the other from wind. You can't carry any weapon. And the Stasi did not know how to deal with them. That movement then spread through East Germany. And historians today will say one of the reasons for the fall of the Berlin Wall was that movement of people. It was a pilgrimage with a holy purpose. You think of the civil rights movement. You think of John Lewis and his march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Of all those occasions when people were moving forward with holy purpose. So I think pilgrimages are also a way in which we in which we move out from centers of power to recenter ourselves and then move back into those places with holy purpose. The last thing we need to leave in any pilgrimage and in, in, in all our journeys is actually life itself. A pilgrimage teaches us how to leave life. Any pilgrimage calls us away from a settled past and beckons us towards a future that's infused with spiritual presence. That's what a pilgrimage does. And our last journey is that journey toward death. And we are called away from a settled path and beckoned towards a future infused with spiritual presence. The powerful image of this is, of course, crossing the Jordan, which comes from the story of the people of Israel wanting to go to the promised land and not knowing how to make that final crossing across the Jordan and being empowered to do so. In the tradition of African-American spirituals, 
that's where the image of crossing the Jordan comes from. And what is often used as the last journey in life. So my conclusion is to say that in our time and in our culture, and particularly in this time of tumult, of racial reckoning, of a surging pandemic, of political polarization, we need to discover again the power of pilgrimage. We need to go on our own inward journeys. And we need to learn how to embody our faith in concrete practices. It's a countercultural way, I think, to guide our faith formation and discipleship. But I think it's a it's an impulse and a movement that we desperately need to recover. I'm privileged for that reason to be some of this in a Catholic setting at Seton Hall, because I think some of the things discarded by my tradition, the reform tradition, need to be recovered. And there are things which the Catholic tradition in various ways has kept alive, like the contemplative tradition, like so much of that deeper calling into the life and, and love of God. And I think pilgrimages and their spiritual power are one of them, one of those. So that's that's what I've tried to share in this book that's just been released today. And that's what I'm so glad to be able to share with you who are gathered uh, at, at, at this time. And I'm looking forward now, Nancy and Marta, to some time of dialogue. Well, Wes, first, I just want to say thank you. That was. I just found your talk incredibly inspiring and, and powerful. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Marta uh, and, uh, you know, may, we have a, a, a you know group here. I, I know three of my students at least are here. And so, um, you know, feel free to ask questions. Don't be shy. Uh, yeah, I think what would be a good thing. First of all, I see all of you are, are muted. So if you're going to ask questions, unmute yourself. Um, we can do it in two different ways. We can do it by uh, uh, raise, you can raise a hand three ways right just now, or you can do it through the icon, or we can enter the question into chat. It's really up to you the way that you'd like to do it. So I open it up, open it up to, to you all. OK, Father. Yes, I, I, just I, like I mean, I knew I knew my friend uh, John was <laughs> going to have the first question. <laughs> it's been part of our long relationship. He always <laughs> asks the tough question. <laughs> well, I just have, uh, for, first of all, at this point, a comment, a comment to make. First of all, uh, like like Nancy, I appreciated your presentation uh, very, very much and the way you've done this. This is great. I just, as you were speaking, I just remembered what one of the things that came to mind was John Paul II's trip to the Nordic countries in 1989, the five Nordic countries. And he, he, he often said that this was one of the most important voyages that he had made in, in his, with his many, uh, many visits to different the Catholic Church in different countries, always making contact with other churches while he was there. But after his visit to Norway, I think one of the things that the Norwegian Lutherans reestablished was a pilgrimage to Trondheim, uh, which had been there, you know, for a long been there, but the, if, after the Reformation was was stopped. And they reestablished that. It was a pilgrimage, I think, to the tomb of St. Olaf in Trondheim. And it, it, they, they just began to rediscover the value of pilgrimage for some reason, just having this contact with, with the Bishop of Rome. And I always thought that was an interesting part of that visit of the Pope to the Nordic countries. So I just had that comment. Uh, that in I'm fact, I, I, uh, I didn't know that the background to that story, that was during the time that uh, I was on the staff of the World Council of Churches in Geneva, and I I remember that trip. But what you say 
about reestablishing that is absolutely true. Um, there is now a, a whole pilgrim pilgrim route called Olaf's Vague or Olaf's Way. You can go online and find it. And in fact, it's becoming a more popular pilgrimage site, going to the Nidaros Cathedral in Trondheim. And this was, in fact, another pilgrimage site in the in the uh, Middle Ages before the Reformation, as you say, uh, that particularly attracted those from Northern Europe who couldn't go all the way to Santiago de Compostela, Compostela much less to Rome or to Jerusalem. And and uh, it is. Um, it, it, it has certainly been revived. I was I was there with my wife uh, three or four years ago for the WCC Central Committee, and uh, we were able to, we met in Tranium, and in fact, I saw the Pilgrim's House that is there and uh, talked with some who, who have been, um, who, who have been trying to foster this. So it is, it is actually, uh, it, it's actually the one, um, uh, Pilgrim, uh, Pilgrim Way that I, I would still like to do since my ancestry is Nor Norwegian, so it would be uh, it would be great. But you're you're so great to bring up the connection to John Paul II and how that got started. Well, Wes, I had two questions for you. Um, the first is you talk about several different uh, pilgrim um, sites that you went to to Lourdes. You worked on the Camino. You went to Santora de, de Chimayo, I guess it's called. Chimayo, yes. And um, I wanted you to tell us which pilgrimage meant the most to you and, and why. And also as a follow-up question, um, that the book is largely autobiographical. And I wanted to know what the biggest thing you learned about yourself is in writing the book. Hmm. Wow, what a great question, Marta. <clears throat> I, think the, um, I think the answer to your first question um, I, I, I would probably have to say the Camino de Santiago. Um, okay. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the classic one. It's the one most familiar. Uh, and I think it's because um, when you're when you're walking someplace where you realized hundreds of thousands have walked the same path over a thousand years. Um, and then when you meet people and you know, you don't say, well, this is who I am. I'm, I was general secretary of the Reformed Church of America, or I was this, or I was that. You meet someone who come from Australia or Germany or uh, Spain, and your first question is, why are you on the pilgrimage? It's the natural question to ask. And so the conversations you have are, are, are just rich and real. Uh, so I, I think that was, although, I, as you could tell from my sharing, I was I was emotionally impacted very deeply by my visit to Lourdes mm -hmm. in a way that I hadn't expected. Um, and as far as what I learned writing this, it's what I already shared in one of those steps. And for me, as a you know, as a person who uh, was the general secretary or the you know the leader of of, of actually the oldest Protestant denomination in with a continuing ministry in the United States, the Reformed Church in America. Uh, it's it's a little embarrassing because because I think what I what I learned were the limitations of my own tradition mm -hmm. uh, and the ways in which while I I understand what you know, what the Belgic Confession and the Canons of Dort and the Heidelberg meant in that period, as well as so many others. Uh, I also came to see how you just can't wrap faith up in a neat confessional box. And um, and that's, I guess, because I'm retired and I'm only getting Social Security, no one's paying my salary, I could say that now. <laughs> but, but uh, uh, but but I but that 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 actually has been a very deep learning for me, Martin. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. I actually had a question, Wes, about Nigeria. Um, my daughter and I went to Nigeria uh, the summer before last with a friend from Seton Hall, who's a sister um, from Nigeria, 
and uh, she invited us and we stayed at a seminary. And I, I think what you were talking about um, in terms of the spirituality was something that really resonated uh, with me from that experience. Uh, it, it was like a, a pilgrimage in certain ways, I would say, because you could just see so much um, joy in, in the people and, and especially um, in, the, in every mass when, when the, if we would have the offertory, people would walk up and put something in and they would literally dance uh, with such joy of giving things. And sometimes it wasn't money, sometimes it was other things, but it was very beautiful. And so I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that particular pilgrimage. Well, <clears throat> I'd be happy to. And uh, I think Monsignor Rodano, I, I, uh, I have to ask your forgiveness because when we were friends, I always called him Jack. <laughs> so but in this setting, I got to, you know, it's John Rodano Monsignor. So Monsignor Rodano yeah, and I. Yeah, call me Jack. Call me Jack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we were, uh, I was a staff and then later a member uh, of the Central Committee of the World Council of Churches. And, uh, and, and Jack was uh, on with the World Council. So that's how we were, became good friends. But um, at, 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 one central committee. I sat down at a. We were round table. And we started to introduce each other, and there was a there was a guy there, Archbishop Rufus Osatelu, and I introduced myself and said I was General Secretary of the Reformed Church of America, and he said, uh, you know, Archbishop Osatelu, I'm uh, head of the um, uh, Church of the Lord out of Laura, which I'd never heard of, and uh, and as we began talking, he said. Um, well, we've just come from a festival that we have every year. It's be, we do this. We have a time of prayer and celebration and fasting before we enter into big decisions. And we gather our cabinet and so forth. And and then after that, we invite people to come and gather with us. Um, and I said, well, this sounded like a pretty good idea. And so I asked him a few more questions. And I said, well, so when you ask people from your church, how, how many come? And he said, oh, about 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I began to realize there's a whole different reality going on here. African instituted churches, which means churches that were begun by Africans for Africans, not begun by missionaries, are one of the phenomena uh, of, of several that are driving growth of the church in Africa. And this church, the Church of Lord Artelor, is one of the very few that belongs ecumenically to the World Council. And so he said to me, Wes, you, you have to come sometime and join our church and our celebration. You know, we do this every year. And I said, sure, you know what? Well, finally, he graciously, uh, he was also very involved in the Global Christian Forum. And we were meeting to choose a new, uh, a, a new secretary. In fact, we were meeting at the Vatican, hosted by, by um, uh, Father Andre, who had succeeded Jack. And and uh, and Rufus Osatella was there, and he said, "Wes, I really want you to come." So I said, "Okay, I promise you." I got to Nigeria, and uh, was one of only a couple of ecumenical guests, and I witnessed how tens of thousands of people coming from all parts of that country gather in this space that's only used for this celebration. And they come to pray, they come to dance, they come to sing, and it goes on and on. It was, I think, at about 2.30 or 3 in the morning when Archbishop Osatello finally came forward to give his sermon. <laughs> and, then, and, then it, and then it kept going after that. It was a, the next day, I went to their humble headquarters and I was there to meet with uh, with the archbishop and some others. And one of his deputies, also a bishop, I was sitting in his office and I said to him, uh, Bishop, you know, in the, in the West, in my tradition, our faith often gets kind of stuck in our heads. And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, well, here we believe that our faith has to move through every pour every part of our body. Uh, there's all this talk today about embodied faith. You know, it's kind of one of the new theological deals that people put a lot of emphasis on rightly. Well, 
embodied faith is what I really witnessed there. Uh, and I think the same thing that you witnessed, Nancy. Yes. Uh, it, it, it is faith that just moves at a different level. And, and I think something, it's one reason why the church in Africa is growing so fast. And it's one of the things that the church in Africa needs to teach to the church in the North. Yeah, it's so true. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Ines, do you want to read your comment? First. Um, yeah, this is an observation, Wes. I bring students to uh, to Italy um, almost twice a year, and not necessarily all our students are Catholics. I have Protestant students, I have uh, Jewish students, I have Muslim students, I have students that have no faith, uh, atheists. So, but all you know go in this pilgrimage. So my my <clears throat> my my take has always been that pilgrimage is an exercise that really unites people, right? Students in this case. So uh, the main difference between Catholic and Protestant or other students, pilgrims, is that when we arrive at the sites, of course, my Protestant students or Muslim students do not worship the saints, right? For example, we go in pilgrimage to Padre Pio or to, yeah. So that is the main difference. How long the pilgrimage I put in front of us uh, how long is the pilgrimage, the road is in front of us to sort out these differences so we can go in pilgrimage and, you know, maybe worship the saints together? And can pilgrimage help the ecumenical dialogue? We are the pilgrim church after all now. So. Uh, I love that, Inez, and I want to start with your second uh, question first. Um, I think pilgrimage has a great gift and role to play in our ecumenical work. And uh, I experienced this when I was on the Camino de Santiago. Uh, and and the, the unity that you feel as you feel because you are going forward to a, in a common experience. Um, and you know, this, uh, let's face it, this is biblical. In the Hebrew scriptures, in the stories of the Old Testament, was a pilgrimage site. And all the psalms of ascent are psalms that were sung. Pilgrims go up because Jerusalem's up high as they go up to Jerusalem. And, and those psalms that we often cite about how great it is when people are living together in unity, those were psalms sung by people of Israel on pilgrimage going to Jerusalem. Uh, and, 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 people of, and people of Israel, with, with all of these sharp divisions and tensions, who were longing for that unity. So, I mean, this goes way back. You see it at Pentecost, um, the, the, you know, the coming, the coming together. And, and I, you know, the World Council of Churches, uh, 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 from their last assembly, uh, they adopted a theme of pilgrimage, well, Pilgrimage of Justice and Peace. It came out of the Busan Assembly, a Pilgrimage of Justice and Peace. Well, Justice and Peace wasn't anything new for the World Council. I mean, they've always been about justice and peace, but they added pilgrimage to it and began to reflect on how, you know, how, how can we understand our journey ecumenically as a pilgrimage? Um, you know, uh, we there are lots of approaches to uh ecumenical life. I mean, Jack knows them so well, and some of you do too. The faith and work movement, the uh, life—I mean, the, the the faith and order movement, the life and work movement. That's where I was when I directed church and society. The, you know, these classic approaches. If 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 I were to have a say today in recommending an ecumenical method, I'd say, go gather, you know, twenty church leaders from around the world, from as diverse places as possible, and 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 say to them for 10 days you're going to go on a pilgrimage to wherever to santiago de Compostela or to tranium or to wherever and just see what happens when they're on that embodied experience together so um that excuse me for getting excited but yeah but i but i i, I think pilgrimages have a lot of, and then your first question inez um how do we uh you know Catholics revere 
the saints and Protestants have this skepticism and uh, and then those of, of uh, obviously of other faiths, and it's I haven't mentioned, but pilgrimage and other religious traditions, which I do not focus on in my book, but that's also a huge theme, which is really worthy of, of, of reflection. But I, I think it goes back to, to, to really getting beyond our understanding of, of the secular age. Um, I, I, think, I think it's when all of us begin to recover the ways in which Western modern culture has squeezed spirituality out of its life. And I don't mean in ways that are, are um, what would I say, reactionary. I mean, in, I mean, in very, in very real ways, we don't understand the world properly. Uh, we, you know, wh why we have a climate crisis? Because we haven't understood the way of, of God's very presence in the creation itself. Um, and I, you know, look, I, I have no idea what bones are in the cathedral at the at at, uh, at uh, Santiago de Compostela and I have no idea whether uh, in fact when James was beheaded uh, they took his body and his head and put it in a boat which somehow traveled all the way from Jerusalem to northern Spain and then got buried okay I mean that's that that's that's the legend I but I'm not gonna I, I'm no longer pass judgment on that what I do know is that hundreds of thousands of people have come to the cathedral at Santiago to Compostela and been touched by a deep spiritual experience of God. And I'll take that. I'll take that. Um, Claudia, do you want to ask your question? Claudia, are you? I think, um, I think uh, she'd like you to ask it for her. Uh, okay, I couldn't tell whether it was fin what, what she. Okay, so her question is: How do you link your deep concern with social justice with your themes of pilgrimage? And then she says, "Okay, I think you just answered that, but maybe you could <laughs> expand on it a little bit." Well, first of all, I think this is Claudia Beversluis, who's a wonderful friend from, from mm -hmm. uh, uh, my time in the in reform community in uh, in West Michigan. And she's a she's a terrific leader in Christian education, was formerly provost at Calvin University. Forgive me for uh, saying that, but I think I've recognized you. Um, I, and, uh, and the question you ask is a very real one. Um, I, I think there, and there are two quick answers. One of them I already reflected in the talk I gave. Um, uh, at we all know, particularly at this time, that our work for justice, our work for seeing God's justice in the world, which you know has propelled so much of my own journey, uh, it it's got to be rooted in a deep experience of God's love. It's got to be sustained inwardly. Uh, it was Church of the Savior that told me that the inward journey always has to accompany the outward journey. And 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 I think I think that the whole movement is especially now in this after the election, we're trying to catch our breath. We're in this time of racial reckoning. We've still got a surging pandemic. We are tired. We are depleted. We need to replenish ourselves. And I think we need to journey within. A pilgrimage is a physical way of doing that. You could walk. I've done a reflection guide to go with the book, by the way, which is just out today, too. And, and you know, you could do this from your home. Uh, you could do this from your chair. You could also do it just walking 10 miles from your home each day. But we, I mean, we need to replenish our inner lives. And then the second, and, and, and in order to really sustain our work for social justice. Then the second thing I'd say is what I've already alluded to. I think that movement and pilgrimage uh, and issues around the border, where many in the Catholic community are deeply involved, as well as as, as well as Protestants, you've had several pilgrimages going cross border religiously, trying to trying to really focus the issue 
of, 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 of immigrants and refugees. Uh, so I think pilgrimage has become a powerful way of embodying what we're trying to say when we try to point to God's, uh, to God's uh, expectations of justice in this world. Father? Um, since I don't hear anyone stepping in, I just wanted to, <laughs> what you're saying reminds me of another another event with pilgrimage involving John Paul II. And that was when he called the Day of Prayer for Peace in Assisi mm -hmm. in 1986. Of course, there was prayer. Everyone went to a different place to pray, every, different religions and each in a different place. And then they all came together to be present while the someone, one group prayed. They avoided syncretism. But two other aspects of that day were fasting and pilgrimage. They had uh, after the uh, before they had a, a, a brief lunch, which was fasting, very simple bread and water or whatever. But then that was followed by a pilgrimage. They went up to one end of Assisi and the whole group of them walked in a kind of pilgrimage through the town of Assisi to St. Francis Cathedral, where they had the final moment of the day when different groups prayed in the presence of others. But there was pilgrimage involved in that because maybe all the world's religions, one of the, 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 the religions, different religions pray, different religions fast, Different religions have pilgrimage, all of these things that can be, and, and prayer, all of these things can be helpful in building a way to peace in the world where different religions can be involved. But pilgrimage was a part of that day of prayer for peace in Assisi. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you reminded us of that, Jack. The, the, the day of prayer in Assisi has had an enormous influence um, and was one of those initiatives that's that's adored. Uh, I, I I've never I, I've never been to one. I wish I I wish I could, but I've spoken with others who have participated, and as you say, uh, really moving experiences. But what really what really intrigues me is that um, uh, the way people move together physically has a kind of attraction. I mean, it, you know, it, it, it's, I think there's something deeper here to, to understand why, you know, why is it that, um, that moving together, I, I, I like to think of pilgrimage as walking with a holy purpose to a holy destination. And sometimes the destination isn't even all that clear. But the walking together is as important. Uh, so many pilgrims get to Santiago de Compostela, and 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 there uh, you see this in the way in the movie by with Martin Sheen uh, that the, it gets reflected there, and it's kind of like, well, they've arrived there, and that's special. But what really was the gift was the way, was what, what, what was was the journey that ended up being. The real gift, and I I think when you look at the kind of uh, divisions we have, uh, whether you're speaking politically or or just in what Father Rodano and I have dealt with so much, the the continuing religious divisions, um, it's powerful when people see those who have difference walking and moving towards some place together in common. It, this in, it embodies something that people are, are yearning for. So, I, I, you know, others have studied this, but I, I mean, I think there's something deep here. And I, yeah, you, why is it that we remember Assisi? And why in the world, I, I keep asking this, why in the world do 272,000 people make this journey 
to Santiago de Compostela. And you know, when I talk with them, I would say nine out of 10 do not set foot in a church. They are not, in, you know, now some of them are practicing. Yeah, yes, yeah, so you meet some devout prep, but the majority, they're, they're, they're not active church goers, whether it's Protestant or Catholic. They've had some kind of religious experience, but yet they're on this Camino out of a spiritual search. And, and I, I, I keep asking, what's going on there? There's, I mean, it's tapping into a hunger that people have that, that uh, you know, that often gets bypassed by our formal church structures, but, but carries a power. So that's, that's kind of two answers to your observation, Jack, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad you've, I'm glad you've brought up uh, the World Day of Prayer at CC. Okay, I think we have time for about one more question. Well, I'll just bring in a comment. Uh, Please, Nancy. I think uh, there's something uh, about walking. I, I, you know, you mentioned that, like, for me, I often hike in the woods. Um, I don't know if you call that a pilgrimage, but for me, it's a, it, you know, I often combine it with prayer and it's just so restorative. And I think, you know, uh, but I think also, that I think you're talking about a kind of mystery, a sense of that we've lost in our world um in the in the contemporary world that we've lost the sense that nature and the universe can can offer mysteries that connect us with god and i think you know that's that's what a pilgrimage can connect people with you know that there is there is something and i, and I, I somehow feel that to some extent in the woods but i know that these sites it's even more that way i can tell and it's very moving and and powerful to listen to it, to listen to you talk about. It. But I think I think that's what we've lost, and uh, you know we need to regain. You know, Nancy, we are uh, <clears throat> we're we're not that far away from the beginning of Advent and the uh, celebration of the Incarnation. Uh, one thing that also impressed me so deeply, and that I write about is how um, pilgrimage opens you up to the way in which God's presence has entered into the material world. And it's partly what you're saying. And, you know, that can be in these dramatic ways in which people going to uh, just take Santiago de Compostela believe that these bones are living. Their spiritual power in this material thing. Mm -hmm. uh, at Lords, you know, I, uh, I still, I still have the bottle of water from Lords, <laughs> and it's it, it sits on my desk. Now, I mean, I mean, it's probably just water, but I I like it sitting on my desk, <laughs> you know, and and. Uh, and, and at Chamayo, where, where the, uh, which is not far from where I live, uh, where the story uh, is that a, a cross was uncovered that had been buried for, for many uh, hundreds of years, and that, uh, and that a beam of light came and, and uh, illumined this, and they took the dirt where the cross was buried and put it in a place where they began to build a chapel. Well, now there's this church, thousands of people come and you go into this little room and you and, and people will take a little Tupperware or a prescription bottle and put a little dirt in it and take it home with them. Um, it's you're, you're interacting with the physical elements and you're saying there's some spiritual quality, which is supposed to be what the sacraments are about. Right. I mean, it's a whole sacramental view of reality, which is key to the incarnation. Absolutely. And I don't think we've understood the incarnation nearly as pervasively as we should, because it's in the incarnation where this division between the material and the spiritual, which is a fiction in our modern culture, that's where it's overcome. Yeah. So 
um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Love it. One of the things I really liked, Wes, about the book is the idea of, you know, when you of just taking a step forward and not knowing what's going to be there and just trusting in faith that things are going to work out. I think that's a really beautiful image and uh, it's very true in, in life. Um, so I, I thank you for that um, observation. Right. Well, I think our, our time is, is just about up and I, I this was a really rich and um, very meaningful uh, discussion. So I just want to thank you, uh, Wes, so much for, for spending the time with us. And uh, for those of you um, who are guests, um, Wes's book is available as of today. And I uh, I know I'm going to get it. <laughs> and uh, we'll, I'm going to get a copy also in the core office so that faculty can, you know, have maybe a couple copies so we can have it available to faculty. And this tape of the of this event will be available. I'll make it available to you, Wes, and of course we'll put it on the core uh, website and the Catholic Studies and so forth, so we can, you know, have access to it. You could you could find the book on. I mean, Amazon's got a Kindle version if you want that. Oh, okay, that's and that's you great. Could, but you could also I've got a website. It's very simple. It's just wesgm.com, wesgm.com, and that's got information about the book, about the Camino. In the next day, I'll have the reflection guide posted there, and that's for free. It's a it's it's a really good reflection guide to download for any group that, you know, want to go kind of go into this uh, with some resources that might may, may help them uh, go on this journey. So uh, Nancy and, uh, and, and Jack and Inez and Marta and all of you who have joined, this is a great joy for me and it's so it's so great to renew my connection to Seton Hall this way uh, around this theme and on this day. Let's hope it's in person next time. <laughs> I'd love to. Yep. Yes, thank you for enriching us with your presentation, Wes. Thank you. Well, yeah. Thank you. Yes, it's thank wonderful you very to much. see you again and see all of thank you. Thank you. Thank you so right. much. God bless you. Thanks so much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, John, for sure. For bringing this to us. Thank you for sponsoring this. I, I thought it was amazing. So I'll, I think it takes a day or two for the recording to be available, but I'll make sure that um, everybody has a link to it and especially Wes. I guess I have to stop the recording. So let me just do that now.